Uh, I'm Don Wallace. I'm the chairman of the International Law Institute, and I want to welcome you to our webinar. I've been asked to say a word or two about the International Law Institute. We're principally uh, trainers, capacity builders, to help countries, mostly developing country governments, participate more effectively in the international economic system. We have centers, including the International Investment Law Center, of which the co-directors of Borzu Sabahi, who's one of the contributors to the webinar, and the others, Ian Laird, who's our moderator. Ian, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wallace. It's always a, a privilege uh, to follow you uh, on one of these uh, panels, webinars. Um, it's my privilege today to moderate uh, our webinar on reform in investment arbitration, new developments at ICSID and Uncentral. And I'm very pleased to have uh, an eminent and experienced uh, panel of folks who will provide uh, commentary on our topics today. Um, uh, our basic agenda today is to start off with uh, a review of the latest uh, amendments uh, to the ICSID uh, rules, uh, and uh, Mallory Silberman will be uh, handling uh, the initial duties to provide that uh, update, and uh, hopefully that'll generate uh, uh, lots of discussion and questions from our audience. And just on that point, on a point of administration, we do have the ability for uh, questions. Uh, and there, uh, at the bottom of your page, there's a Q&A. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in asking questions or posing questions, please uh, use that uh, button. Uh, I also just want to mention uh, on that same topic that uh, we're being recorded today. So uh, anything you may say uh, will be uh, recorded. Um, so. Uh, Mallory Silberman, um, welcome. It's great to have you here. Uh, Mallory is a partner at Arnold Porter uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, she practices extensively in the international investment uh, arbitration field, and uh, she currently serves a, as the chair of the International Dispute Resolution uh, uh, Committee and the D.C. Bar and is an adjunct professor at uh, Georgetown University Law Center. She has uh, been closely monitoring and uh, commenting on ICSID reform uh, for a number of years uh, now, and I'd like to take the opportunity to, uh, to recommend to folks uh, an excellent series of uh, short commentaries uh, on the new rules uh, that she has produced in LinkedIn. And if you go to hashtag uh, ICSID rules amendments, uh, all one word, uh, you'll be able to access that. Um, and then the second uh, item on our agenda today, we'll follow up with a discussion on the Uncentral Working Group 3 uh, reform process. And uh, this has been going on uh, for a number of years and has resulted in a lot of intense uh, discussion over wide ranging potential reforms of the investor state dispute settlement system. I'll use the acronym ISDS. Uh, other folks refer more broadly to bilateral investment treaty bits or uh, provisions in free trade agreements or, or the like. So this is a, a big a big topic. And we have two speakers uh, who will present uh, some of uh, the uh, initial uh, comments uh, and information to, to provide us with some updates. Um, will be uh, Karen Kaiser. And uh, Karen is an attorney advisor. Uh, in the Office of the Private International Law, uh, in the Office of the Legal Advisor at the U.S. Uh, Department of State. She uh, represents uh, the U.S. Uh, at, in numerous um, uh, fora, including Uncetral and the Hague Conference, as well as uh, Unidra. Uh, and in particular at Uncetral, she's been uh, very active leading the group um, that has, uh, from the U.S., that has been uh, participating in the Working Group 3 uh, discussions, which have, uh, as I mentioned, been going on for a number of years uh, now. Um, she's also served in other capacities uh, in the U.S. government, uh, uh, a lot of that dealing with um, uh, investment arbitration and bilateral investment treaties, uh, including negotiating those treaties and uh, being counsel uh, on numerous cases uh, in the past. So this is someone with a lot of great experience uh, in this field and is well equipped uh, on this topic. Uh, just to mention, she's also served as an adjunct professor here at the Washington 
School of Law at American University uh, in Washington, DC. So it's great to have uh, Karen uh, here today and looking forward to her comments. Um, as well, we have uh, Lauren uh, Mandel, who's a special counsel at uh, Wilmer uh, Hale here in Washington, DC. Uh, he he uh, as well specializes in international trade and uh, is an investment arbitration attorney. Uh, in the past, he's uh, been involved in the negotiation of free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties, uh, and uh, as well as uh, involved in nu numerous cases uh, involving the resolution of disputes uh, under those types of agreements. Um, prior to joining uh, Wilmer, um, Lauren uh, served for six years uh, in the senior legal and policy roles at USTR, and in particular, uh, he served in the role uh, from 2016 to 19 uh, as Deputy Assistant USTR for Investment. Um, and he played a very uh, active role as the US lead negotiator of the investment chapter of the uh, US MCA, uh, US Mexico Canada agreement, which includes uh, a lot of innovations uh, in the investment uh, arbitration field. So we have a fantastic uh, lineup of folks today. Um, you'll also see on the screen my colleagues, uh, Dr. Bor Borzu Sabahi. Borzu, as Don mentioned, is the co-director of the Investment Center at uh, the ILI and is a partner at uh, Curtis Millay, Provo Colt and Mosul. I got it all, full name. <laughs> and uh, we also have uh, Dr. Jose Antonio Rivas, who's uh, uh, also one of our co-advisors on investment uh, at the International Law Institute. And he's an adjunct professor at uh, uh, Georgetown University Law Center, as well as uh, the founding uh, partner of X Strategy, uh, a uh, really interesting uh, boutique firm here in Washington, DC, handling uh, all sorts of investment arbitration and uh, commercial arbitration matters. And uh, it's great to have you here as well. Jose Antonio and Borzu and Jose Antonio may jump in and post some questions and comments as we go along, but uh, no pressure, no obligations. <laughs> so uh, once we've got through those preliminaries, uh, I think we want to move on to our first topic. And uh, this is concerns uh, the much heralded ICSID amendments, which uh, as many of you who follow these uh, developments will know that on January 20th, the new ICSID amended rules were submitted uh, by ICSID to the Administrative Council, and ultimately there will be a vote coming on uh, March 21st, uh, I recall, and that uh, subject to that vote, um, there, the those rules will come into force on July 1st, uh, 2022. And so there's been a lot of work over the last five years uh, uh, a lot of consultations and uh, discussions, and uh, so full marks to ICSID and the folks there for uh, what has been an incredible journey. And uh, you know there have been a lot of new developments, and and I think this is a great opportunity for people to to understand some of the scope and and the nature of those developments. We're not going to be able to get through all of them today. Uh, we have limited time, but we'll try to hit some of the highlights. Uh, and if folks have specific questions or areas that, that they'd like to uh, hear more commentary from the group, uh, we certainly welcome that. And um, from from that, I will hand off to uh, Mallory for uh, her initial comments. Mallory. Thank you, Ian. And good afternoon, good evening, or even good morning to everyone as the case may be. So Ian, I don't know if you were on the call yet when I mentioned this yesterday, but about four or so years ago in January of 2018, I had the pleasure of attending another reform focused event that you and many of the others on the screen also had organized. And it was a kickoff event of sorts for the DC arbitration world's foray into this issue of reform. And at the time I was just in the audience, but Professor Wallace gave us this great overview of what I think had been the first session of Uncitral Working Group 3 that had really dug into the issue of ISDS reform. And I remember that day vividly because when I left the event and got back to my office, I got a phone call saying that I had been promoted to partner. So for me, it is an especially great honor to be here as a speaker today, coming full circle and discussing this issue of reform. 
Now, since the time of that other event, in the ensuing years, I've gone on to participate as both a speaker and a delegate in various of the reform meetings. So I should say before anything else that all of my comments here today are made in a personal capacity and shouldn't be attributed to either my law firm or to its clients. But with that typical caveat out of the way, let's get the discussion started. Now, as Ian mentioned, the goal of this part of the webinar is to give you a brief update on the ICSID rules amendments before we open the floor to discussion and questions. And out of the many, many things that I could say on this topic, I've decided today to just focus on five simple points. The first of which is a practical point, which is that we could discuss this topic for days. And in fact, people have done so for years. By way of reminder, here's a brief recap of what's happened. Now, I say brief, and I'm about to start with an event that took place 15 years ago, but I promise that this part will move quickly. So 15 years ago, in April of 2006, these booklets took effect. And as many of you know, they contain the rules and regulations that apply in the context of any ICSID proceeding. At the time, in April of 2006, ICSID was almost 40 years old, and it had seen about 200 cases across that 40-year history. But in the decade that followed, as ICSID marched toward its 50th birthday, the total number of cases more than tripled to a cumulative total of about 640. And during the course of those cases, many different lessons were learned, and ICSID decided that those lessons should be reflected in the rules. And so in late 2016, the center launched a new effort to amend and update the rules. Specifically, in October of that year, ICSID invited the member states to identify topics for debate and discussion that would be reflected in the new rules. A few months later, in January 2017, ICSID extended the same invitation to the public. And since that time, there have been numerous meetings, both in person and virtual, and the center has also published six working papers like this one, which I should say is only one language version of one of the working papers. Together, the working papers span more than 3,500 pages of text. Now, in addition to these meetings and the working papers, ICSID has also received written feedback from all parts of the world and from all sorts of stakeholders, including arbitrators, academics, practitioners, and more than six dozen government delegations. At issue have been the ICSID arbitration rules proper and a host of other regulations and norms that I'm just going to refer to generally as the rules, but these are the administrative and financial regulations, the ICSID institution rules, the conciliation rules, the various similar rules that apply in the context of an additional facility case, a standalone set of proposed fact-finding rules, a new proposed set of rules for investor state mediation, and a variety of schedules and models and codes. And as this, summer, this summary alone could attest, but I also can attest as someone who bore witness to this process, this was a gargantuan task. And so before I say anything else on this subject, here's the second point that I want you to remember, which is that the rules didn't just write themselves. They took time, they took effort, they took energy. They took years from ICSID staff and civil servants, some of whom are attending today and whom I would urge you in due course to give a round of applause because it's an incredible thing and unimaginably difficult to have many hundreds of delegates from 150 plus countries to come together to try to edit one document. And throughout this process, they were so committed. They were so professional and so collaborative. Everyone truly was trying to do this exercise right. Now, that's not to say that there weren't disagreements. And in fact, my third point is that there were disagreements. And there likely still are on individual rules or wordings or comma placement. But reaching a consensus takes compromise. And each delegation had to quote unquote, pick its battles. And so with that by way of preface, I want to speak now to the litigators, my fellow litigators. Now, a few weeks ago, as Ian mentioned, on January 20th, 
the ICSID secretariat submitted the rules for a vote. And under the ICSID convention, the relevant votes will be cast by the member states, as Ian said, by the Administrative Council of ICSID. And here's the point for the litigators. The member states are only voting on the rules. They're not voting on the contents of the working papers. They're not voting to endorse the reasoning behind a particular change. They're voting only on the rules themselves, the package of rules. And it seems important to mention that before everyone goes out and tries to interpret the rules in a case. Now, as Ian mentioned, ICSID has said that it anticipates that the member states will be casting their votes on or before March 21st of this year. And if the rules are approved, which will require a two third vote in their favor, ICSID has said that the rules will go into effect on the 1st of July of this year. So those are the first three simple points, which have all been largely about process. But for the last two points, I'd like to turn to the contents of the rules. And my fourth point is in essence, an apology to the audience, because as I sit here in the time that we all have, I'm not going to be able to canvas all of the changes to the rules. And the reason for that is that there have been so many changes. By way of background, and as some of you know, this is the fourth time that the ICSID rules have been revised. After the rules first were adopted in 1968, they then were revised in 1984, in 2003, and again in 2006. And most of the revisions in those versions were incremental or discrete. And it would have been pretty easy, for example, to simply run a comparison of the 2003 and the 2006 rules. But this time, during this round of proposed amendments, the revisions are sweeping. And any comparison that you attempted to run would no doubt look like a mess. And that's because, as I said, there have been so many changes. There are structural changes. There are substantive changes. There are additions, subtractions, and even changes to style. Many of the norms have been consolidated, and almost all of the numbers have changed. And so for those reasons, it would probably take me hours just to march through the changes, assuming that you didn't mute me first. And just to put this in context, collectively, in English, Spanish, and French, the proposals that went out to the vote span a total of 600 pages, or almost 600 pages. So in my view, the best way to learn the new, the new rules is to go out and read them, see what jumps out at you. I know it's a lot to read all of those rules and that you might not be able to digest all of them in one sitting. And so, as Ian mentioned, to the extent that it's useful to digest them in daily doses, I've been doing this series on LinkedIn that has two to three minute videos of just a couple of rules at a time. The idea is to give you a brief introduction before you go out and read them in more detail on your own. And because I act as counsel in cases, I should say that I'm not attempting to interpret the rules in these videos. But the idea is just to give you some basic facts about the rules, like what the old rule number was, what the new rule says, what has been moved, amended, et cetera. That brings us to the fifth point and the final point for right now before we open this up to discussion and questions. And that fifth point is that when you go out and read the rules, you'll see all sorts of hot topics that have been the fodder of many papers and panels in recent years. There is new text, for example, that explicitly deals with subjects like third party funding and security for costs. There are rules on the publication of documents and a new proposed mechanism on expedited arbitration. But the pieces that I would encourage you to bear in mind also are all of the little rules that might impact on practice. So for example, ICSID is now moving away from hard copies. The way that things work currently is that when a party files a submission, they are supposed to provide an original and five hard copies to the center. Now the presumption is that filings will be made electronically. In addition, as many DC-based practitioners have benefited from this rule, it seems useful to note that going forward, a holiday at the seat of the center in Washington is no longer going to presumptively shift the deadline to the next business day. So holidays in DC now count as business days for exit purposes. 
In addition to that, a request for arbitration is now going to need to include additional information. And there also have been some small changes regarding the fees that are paid to arbitrators. And before anyone asks, no, the fees haven't increased. The situation is just that at present, an arbitrator is paid an hourly rate for most of her work on an ICSID case. But for purposes of hearing days, there is a flat fee that is set out that is based on an assumption that a hearing day will take eight hours of work. And in practice, a hearing day might be shorter. Despite that, under the current rules, the arbitrator would still be paid the full hearing day fee. Under the new regulation, all of the work by an arbitrator is going to obtain the same hourly fee. And just continuing on with some of these practical revisions, the rules on payment advances have changed. ICSID will be able to discontinue a proceeding more quickly in the event that there is a suspension due to the non-payment of advances. There are deadlines, explicit deadlines for arbitrators to issue all sorts of rulings. And there are also express deadlines that apply to the parties, for example, when bringing arbitrator challenges. So as you can see, and in short, there are so many different things that we can discuss when it comes to the new rules. And I think I'll pause here and turn the floor back to Ian because I'm very interested in where this discussion will take us. Thanks very much, Mallory. That was a great uh, highlight. And I, and I certainly as well uh, encourage folks uh, to go and pour through the, the rules. Uh, there's, there's basically something for everyone. Um, maybe I could just start uh, and, 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 you know, I know Borzu and Jose Antonio and uh, Karen and Lauren may want to jump in. Uh, certainly welcome questions from the audience. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, again, at a very high level, um, an enormous amount of work has clearly gone into this, the input of governments and organizations and practitioners and so forth. Um, how would you characterize kind of where we have come out uh, after all of that work? I mean, going into the, the, the reform exercise, there were certainly um, a lot of uh, expectations of potential changes to certain areas, um, also concerns uh, from, from other uh, quarters about the, uh, the, the nature of those, con those changes. And, and you know, we've always had this um, tension. Um, you could just characterize it as you know, between the investors and the states, but it's, it's never that simple. Um, you know, states have different views, obviously, amongst themselves on certain provisions. The, the whole debate um, uh, that led to the Mauritius Convention on transparency is a good example. There's not necessarily a uniform view on even transparency. So, um, but just sort of taking that into account, the pressures that were coming into uh, these reform efforts and the, the amount of, um, you know, really, you know, very constructive uh, input from all sides. Um, where, where do you think we, we, we come out? Is this a, a balanced set of reforms? Is this tipped the balance in favor of investors or states? Um, where, do you, where do you think we come out on, on that kind of global question? I think it is balanced, and I'd be interested to hear what Karen and Lauren have to say about this. But one point to bear in mind is that states aren't monolithic. There are different agencies and constituencies within each state that might have competing views on various subjects. And remember, a state wears multiple hats. A state might be a potential respondent in some future arbitration case, but a state also is the home to investors who are going abroad and potentially could be claimants in these cases. And a state is a policymaker. So I don't think that just because there have been states who have been participating in this process, that alone means that the rules have been balanced one way or another. The states and the exit secretariat seem to have tried very, very hard to make sure that they, the rules did come out in a balanced way. If I had to pick one thing that seems to characterize the proposed rules, I would say that it's modernization. The rules are much more modern, more streamlined, 
There is less repetition because before there may have been points that were discussed in the administrative and financial regulations, and then again in the arbitration rules multiple times. There has been a real effort to streamline the rules, consolidate points, and group them in an orderly fashion. So if you look at the arbitration rules, for example, they go from the very beginning of the proceeding all the way to the end chronologically. A lot of thought has been put into this, and we'll see in practice how everything turns out. But the intention, as I understand it, certainly was to come out with a balanced set of rules that will work well for everyone. Well, that's great. Um, Borzu, I, I see your hand is up. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ian, uh, for giving me. Uh, thank you, Mallory, for this very excellent uh, introduction. And I'm going to check your LinkedIn post. Forgive me if I haven't so far, but it seems very interesting. Yeah, I think I have, but I appreciate if you could uh, a little bit unpack your first point that this is a package deal and the implications that for litigators perhaps on either what would that mean in terms of going i mean is there one interpretation of rules or different interpretation of rules what is your vision of how this will unfold what it means i appreciate if you comment on that so i think the idea is just that there has been a very long process and time for member states to debate all of the individual rules. And I mentioned comma placement earlier that has come up. You know, there have been very serious good faith discussions about what the rules should say. The people who are in the room discussing these issues count on so much experience across a, a variety of different cases. So there were reasons behind these good faith disagreements about what the rules should say. And in the end, states aren't voting on individual rules. The time for discussion has sort of concluded, at least in this part of the ICSID reform process. And one of the points that came up during the discussions was that the member states didn't want to allow the perfect to become the enemy of the good. So even though there may be small issues that individual delegations still felt weren't exactly quite right or weren't all the way perfect they still are voting now on is this good are we okay with these changes now they might not agree on the reason for the changes the explanation that was given or certain policy statements that were made by other delegations or even by exit itself the question for them now is just do we approve this individual set of rules or this package of rules, or do we not approve of it? That's the only question right now. The time for individual debates about individual particular rules has gone on hiatus. Uh, Jose Antonio, you looked uh, pensive there. Did you want to interject? Thank you, Ian. Um, no, I, I uh... Thank, thank you, Mallory, for for every you know for making a, a very complex uh, uh, topic and extensive um, you know so easily to to understand and inviting everyone to actually uh, do the homework and, and read the rules. Um, my 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 only query was uh, how do you see the uh, you know all, all the work and 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 uh, and uh, sort of um, um, expressions of states and delegates uh, play out later on uh, during uh, eventually uh, an application and interpretation of the rules. I know that you did mention that uh, at this stage uh, they are only voting on the rules themselves, but uh, as we know uh, when, come ca when cases come um, there may be some weight given to uh, the history of uh, these negotiations that you have and many others uh, been participating at. So it, it's tough and it also for me has been fascinating because I have participated as counsel in quite a number of investor state arbitrations and I have been one of those people who has gone back 
to the drafting history of the ICSID convention or Schroer's commentary or the drafter's commentary on the 1968 version of the rules. And I have dutifully cited to all of those sources. And this time I had the honor and privilege of getting to be in the room while some of these discussions were taking place. And I realized that there's so much information that doesn't come through on paper and that can't come through when you are trying to synthesize and do a summary of what happened. So I think I personally will be bearing that in mind whenever I go forward and need to argue about the meaning of a particular rule, that there may be pieces to this that are just not captured in the written version of what's there. And also that you know, this was a good faith process. There was so much experience in the room. People were trying out different ideas. And I think it's important to remember that before you go questioning the meaning of comma placement in a state's comments on one of the working papers. People probably weren't making sinister decisions or particular decisions about how they worded that particular comment and that particular submission to ICSID with the benefit of how someone in the world might interpret that particular statement decades from now. So just having some understanding of the people who were trying their best in this process to improve the system and to consider all of the issues instead of immediately just going and thinking the worst of them when you go and interpret this and use one of those papers in a future case. Thanks on that, uh, Mallory. Um, before we finish off, um, uh, uh, we have one question about mediation and uh, whether the, um, the rules have been able to work in uh, a, a further role for mediation. I know we have the conciliation rules and they were subject to amendments. Uh, any, any highlights there for uh, folks uh, on, on the call who are interested in the mediation conciliation kind of part of this, uh, the, the ICSID uh, rules? So nothing specific off the top of my head. I know that mediation is a subject that also is being discussed at UNCITRAL Working Group 3. Um, this is something that would be based on consent at the center. It will be different from the typical conciliation rules. It really is the first, as I understand it, institutionalized version of rules for investor state mediation. Um, but I don't know if anyone focused more on the UNCITRAL working group has any comments on that. I know there was a paper circulated on that quite recently, maybe in December. Right. Well, and that, uh, you know, it bears repeating uh, conciliation has been a big part of the uh, ICSID regime uh, since the beginning. And the fact that it hasn't been taken up uh, frequently is, you know, a matter for another uh, uh, conference, uh, full discussion. Um, so before we finish off uh, on uh, the extra reforms, um, I just wanted to ask Mallory, what would you would you consider the one or two highlights without giving too much editorial comment as to interpretation or anything? Wh where do you think uh, folks should be perhaps looking to as you know, as an example of kind of the innovations uh, that we've seen? I mean, a couple, you know, uh, you've already mentioned some in your introduction, Production timelines have been tightened up. Um, the process has been more modernized and efficient, which is all very much appreciated. Uh, we've seen uh, additional a lot of discussion around third-party funding. That could be one of the, the elements here. Um, you know, third-party participation, uh, counterclaims has been clarified a bit. Uh, the whole cost regime has been, you know, worked on a little, in a little more detail. I mean, there, there's all sorts of interesting things going on, which, you know, folks will want to dive into, but, you know, from your perspective, uh, what are your thoughts kind of as a final closing thought on this? So I have two answers. One is a general answer, which is that the rules contain so much more detail now, and they explicitly make points that have been a matter of common practice for years. And it, it may be difficult to get a sense of all of those things unless you stare at 
procedural order number one in many, many cases, but many of the points that have just been an implicit understanding or a matter of common practice are now explicitly set out in the rules. So you are seeing a lot more detail throughout all of the rules on many different issues of practice. And then if I had to pick one particular innovation, I would say the inclusion of an explicit rule on security for costs and a clarification that security for costs isn't something that comes up under the provisional measures standard, but really is just part of a tribunal's inherent powers to order. So there's a, a an explicit rule, as I said, on security for costs. I think it's rule 53 in the new proposed rules, and it's definitely worth a read. Okay, well, that's uh, fantastic, Mallory. Really appreciate your uh, coming today and giving us uh, this uh, boot, uh, you know, this summary and, and, and a kick to uh, actually go out and uh, read read the rules, because I, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting new developments there, which folks will likely come upon when it becomes relevant when they're working on a case or researching an issue. But uh, there really has been an enormous amount of work here. And again, full, full marks and congratulations uh, to ICSID for uh, this enormous task. So let's move on to uh, a, update and developments in the Uncentral Working Group 3. Um, you know, just as a matter of background, this is a process that's been also going on for the last four or five years. And uh, if you go just uh, Google Working Group 3 Uncentral, you'll see uh, uh, all the material of the deliberations and the various working papers and reports from each of the sessions. There's been two to three sessions every year, even throughout the uh, pandemic, the working group has been uh, very active. And uh, it really has been a soup to nuts uh, approach, uh, looking at all the procedural uh, issues and, and contentious issues that have been uh, arisen in the, in the field over the last 20 years, but also an address to some very broad uh, systematic uh, responses, including uh, what would equivalent to be to a new world uh, investment court. Um, each of the sessions deals with uh, usually a smaller number of those issues, and we have a session coming up uh, next week uh, in New York. Um, which will be addressing, uh, according to the agenda, three uh, specific issues. The, the idea of a multilateral advisory center has been uh, subject to quite a bit of discussion and that'll be on the agenda. Um, the idea of a standing multilateral mechanism um, as of course, as I mentioned, uh, one of the key areas of discussion in particular, uh, next week, uh, there'll be some discussion on the selection and appointment of ISD tribunals, and there's materials and, and proposals around what that would look like uh, in terms of um, uh, potential provisions and what, what that setting up that panel, that permanent panel of adjudicators uh, would look like. And then a third topic is the draft uh, code of conduct for those adjudicators, and this this could again come in very uh, different forms, but has been a source of discussion between Uncertrol and Exit as well, uh, and a very important uh, um, uh, issue, and one that's, uh, I think, uh, gained a lot of traction uh, in the discussions. So that's kind of a very high level, um, what's sort of to come. I'm gonna pass off the microphone uh, to Karen uh, to give us kind of a little more in-depth uh, sense uh, of uh, where we are and uh, where we'll be going. Uh, so thanks very much, Karen, and I'll uh, go on mute. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Ian, and I want to thank you and Professor Wallace and the rest of the ILI team for the invitation to participate in the seminar today. And, and like Mallory, I want to be clear that um, uh, my, my remarks here are provided in my personal capacity, so they should not be taken as um, uh, expressing a view of the State Department itself, the Legal Advisor's Office, or the U.S. government at large. Um, and with that caveat, um, you know, I think, Ian, you did a great job of sort of teeing up that, you know, this is a process uh, that Working Group 3 has been engaged in since November 2017. Um, it was given its mandate by the Commission earlier that summer. And just for those of you who, just a quick structural um, clarification, UNCITRAL is established as a commission that meets annually, but it's work is done in working groups. And so working group three is the one that's tasked with the investor state dispute settlement uh, reforms. And while it is a wide ranging um, 
uh, uh, topic and the mandate was broad. It's important to also keep in mind, though, that really this working group is looking only at procedural reforms. And there are obviously lots of reforms that could fall outside of that space. But here we're looking primarily at uh, the way in which investor state dispute is conducted and what reforms are, are would be appropriate. And where the working group is now, I think what, what I'm going to do is sort of describe sort of bring us up to speed on the process and where we are and where we're headed and Lauren uh, will probably uh, delve into a little bit more of the of the substance but um, leading up to this upcoming meeting which actually because um, because of the pandemic uh, the agenda has been revised so we'll no longer be considering the multilateral advisory center as a topic, because there will only be four hours every day instead of six hours every day, the time is going to be split between um, consideration of the multilateral investment court selection of the selection process for potential adjudicators and the code of conduct. Um, and like I said, before getting into sort of like what's going to be on the agenda next week specifically, just to sort of understand sort of how we got to where we are, um, the working group, you know, initially its its first stage of its mandate was to identify possible concerns. And there was a long list of concerns that were identified about investor state dispute settlement. Then the process was to decide whether or not their reform was desirable. And interestingly, that was the quickest process because everyone agreed in the working group that reform was desirable, um, which leads us now to the third stage and the more difficult but the roll up your sleeve stage, which is what possible reforms should be developed and recommended to the commission for approval. Now, there are a wide range, as Ian, Ian alluded to, of proposals, things that go from completely replacing the investor state dispute ad hoc process through a multilateral investment court to um, working with the existing system and either adding structural changes like a multilateral advisory center or introducing an appellate review stage or mechanism to the existing process or in a, in a permanent system or in a permanent court, and also procedural changes that might reflect a lot of what we've seen in the ICSID reform uh, process with respect to the rules, but standardizing that and perhaps broadening it to, to all the other um, if you want to think of them as first generation investment treaties that don't have a lot of the innovations that modern agreements um, and while it might seem uh, strange to think of NAFTA as a modern agreement, it was certainly the, the precursor of um, many of the innovations that I think have percolated and are most recently seen in US practice in chapter 14 of the USMCA. Now, stepping back, because we have all of these reforms and of course a limited amount of time, um, uh, an underlying tension has been how to address all of these issues. Um, how do you know which one should come first, which one should get most time. And in April 2019, the working group sort of landed on, on a, a, a general compromise to allocate its time roughly equally between structural reforms and procedural reforms. And in the structural camp, we have um, top issues like the investment court, like appellate review and advisory center. In the procedural area, we have a lot of other issues that we have um, the uh, code of conduct, we have potential reforms to uh, address frivolous claims, to address third party funding, to address security for costs, a lot of the issues um, uh, the, that have come up to um, come to the fore in the ICSID process are also being considered in the UNCITRAL con, uh, process as well. Um, the uh, and then of course there's also mediation and alternative dispute resolution and dispute prevention. So in in considering all of these, um, there was also a concern about whether or not the the resources that the working group had were sufficient. And um, this debate culminated most recently in the past summer with the commission approving a request, which the General Assembly just formally approved uh, this past session, to add an additional week of time for working group three. So um, unlike the other working groups, at least for the next uh, five years, the working group will meet an additional week so that it will have additional time to address all of these issues. And um, it's not as readily available, but I, I um, recommend that if you're interested in sort of seeing where the working group is, is, is headed, um, the commission's 
uh, consideration of the work plan for the working group three, which is in the working group three's report from its resumed 40th session, um, lays out what's an extremely ambitious proposal of formal meetings, informal meetings, drafting groups, and written submissions, and all with the goal of having its work done by the um, commission session in 2026. Now, Mallory was talking about the rules, the ICSID rules themselves taking up to four years imagine taking that multiplied by well, manifold let's even <laughs> begin to think of what what the actual number would be and try to get all of that done so the the working group really does have 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 an ambitious task um, but one of the things i think that's important is that it's going to do its work so that it continues to to make progress in a sequential basis. We're not having sort of everything wait until the end. And so the first project that will be up for commission uh, consideration this summer is potential is likely to be the code of conduct. Um, and the working group will be turning to that in the spring session. But um, just to sort of before turning just to that for a moment, I'd like to flag that coming up across the, the board, the next topics will be um, the uh, ADR mechanism, so there will be work on mediation and dispute prevention. And then the following commission year in 2024, there's a plan to try to have um, something settled on the multilateral advisory center. Um, and then finally, um, uh, ISDS procedural reform rules and more of the details of a court. Now, whether we can get there, we'll have to see, but I think the working group itself is, is committed to that, to that progress and um, is, is, is striving for that. And I think the test of its ability to achieve these objectives will be next week when it meets. And while there will be discussion on the, on the court, I think I'll pause on that one because I think that's at a much more preliminary stage than what we see for the code of conduct. And the code of conduct itself, um, and there was actually a fairly good amount of progress made at the last meeting, not as much progress as would have been hoped to be able to get through a full what's referred to as a first reading of the of the of the document, but we made it all the way through the first eight articles. We'll finish the last three and then hopefully be able to turn to um, consider some of the the um, changes that were made at the last meeting and and consider what I think is the thorniest issue, how to address multiple roles for arbitrators and counsel. Um, I'm mindful of the time, so I'm going to stop there and I'll pass the baton to Lauren, who can kind of tee up some of the uh, issues that are that are at at play in the in the code of conduct and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and, and, and thank you, Ian, and Professor Wallace, and ILI, and the attendees. Uh, this is a great discussion. Uh, I'm privileged to be part of it. Um, I, no, looking at the time, I, I will try to speak quickly, but succinctly and, and clearly uh, to have room for discussion. And I'll focus my comments on Uncentral Working Group 3. Um, uh, I think I'm one of the rare few uh, individuals who's attended every meeting of Working Group 3 since uh, November of 17, both the formal and informal meetings. I'm not sure if that something I should be proud of or not, but it is a true fact. Uh, Don as well, I see, and, and Borzu. Um, uh, originally, I was a member of the US delegation uh, with Karen. Uh, and since May of 19, uh, I have uh, been on the outside as a non-governmental observer in the working group, uh, representing the US Council for International Business. Um, and so I'll look at, at three questions uh, today. Uh, uh, where are we now? Where are we going? And what's on tap for next week? Um, where are we now? I do want to step back for a moment. Um, uh, sort of even beyond uh, July of 17, um, uh, how, do we, how did we get to a, a discussion about investor state reform and working group three? Uh, the European Union uh, went to the commission in 2016, 2017 to seek a mandate uh, for a discussion on ISDS reform uh, with one objective in mind, and that was the creation of a multilateral investment court and appellate mechanism. Um, but since that time, and, and I think Karen's discussion and Ian's as well, demonstrated this, state delegations have proposed a huge number of additional reforms. Uh, the UNCTRAL Secretariat's work plan that Karen mentioned uh, is divided into eight different baskets of reforms. Um, some of these baskets, maybe most of these baskets, have numerous additional reforms within them. And so just as an example, there is a basket of reform discussions on ISDS procedural rules reforms. Um, by my count, 
uh, the ISDS procedural rules reforms basket includes at least 13 separate issues, including, for example, dismissal of frivolous claims, abuse of process, security for costs, allocation of costs. I could go on. Uh, what does this tell us? What does this wide-ranging discussion in the working group tell us? Again, a discussion that ostensibly began with a uh, somewhat narrow focus, thinking about a multilateral investment court, and now has branched out into, into many, many areas. In my view, uh, it, it's a good thing. It reflects uh, a very impressive level of government involvement and commitment in the discussions. Uh, made, I think, more impressive because the last two years of discussions have been in, in, in very difficult circumstances with governments logging in online at all hours of the day and night. And I think that, so when you have this government involvement, you have a wide range of uh, governmental priorities and, that, and, and sort of the range of reforms on the table reflect the fact that governments have a, a wide range of experience uh, in investor state dispute settlement, also in the negotiation of agreements, and they're bringing those experiences to bear uh, in the working group. Uh, I would add that, you know, my perception is that the broad engagement of states reflected in these various proposals is a vote of confidence in the system. Uh, it would be very easy or not, e it would be easier uh, for states to, to not invest the time and resources necessary to painstakingly review the existing system and uh, offer uh, revisions to seek consensus around revisions. It'd be much easier for states to tear up their old treaties to start again. Uh, that's not what they're doing. Uh, some states are, of course, but um, uh, you know, a huge number of states view the system as one that is in need of reform, uh, not reinvention. Uh, and incidentally, I, I looked this morning again, since July of 17, if you look at the UNCTAD database of investment treaties that have been signed, since July of 17, when the mandate was issued for, for this reform discussion, 145 investment agreements have been signed um, uh, globally. Um, uh, and many of these, of course, include investor state dispute settlement, which again, I think is a, is a strong vote of confidence that this dispute settlement system um, is, is fairly balanced. And while it is in need of reform, um, it, is, it is one that does benefit both states, investors, and civil society. I think another example of the strength of the system is, in my view, how little support has materialized in the working group uh, for, for example, the multilateral investment court, uh, a reform that, in my view, would uh, upend the existing system in, in a somewhat negative manner. Um, outside of Europe, I think only a few select states, including some uh, Francophone African states and states that have committed in trade agreements with the EU to explore the creation of a court, have indicated interest publicly uh, in terms of interest in a court. And to be clear, it is still early in the discussion in some respects, and many states certainly are undecided at this point. Uh, but I think this could just not have been what the EU had hoped for in 2017 that 4.5 years in uh, with a very crowded agenda and somewhat uh, tepid support for the court and a long way to go. That's where we are. Now, where are we going? Uh, you know, I think it's, it's too early to say, it's an easy response, I suppose, too early to say, and that we have a working group uh, work plan that takes us to 2026. Uh, but I think where we go depends upon an important choice that the working group needs to make. And that is the following. If the working group prioritizes work on achieving consensus on standards, on core procedural and technical issues, uh, which is what UNCITRAL has done throughout its history successfully, it could achieve quite a lot. And a prime example of that approach, I think, is the code of conduct for arbitrators, uh, which I'll discuss uh, momentarily. And now there are disagreements on these core technical uh, procedural issues, of course, but there's, these are manageable disagreements. Uh, for example, uh, supporters of a multilateral investment court and ad hoc arbitration both support a code of conduct. And so there's a, a common ground to work from. But if the group uh, decides not to prioritize in that manner or see consensus in the manner that I describe, but rather attempts to design a huge number of reforms, each reflecting the interests of a small number of states or a single regional block, for example, I think the working group may achieve very little. And this goes to Karen's question, you know, can we get there? I think we can get there if we do prioritize um, and, and, and with a view to building consensus. But I confess, I'm afraid right now, as we sit here, you know, looking forward to the next meeting, the working group, that uh, there isn't a sort of interest in, in more, not less. And, and priorities, prioritization is kind of a dirty word in some quarters of the working group, that prioritization seems to be an effort to uh, select some reforms at the expense of others. Well, of course it is, but that is the process of reform that um, I think is, it will be necessary if the working group will achieve something in our natural lifetimes. Um, uh, the working group's agenda is overflowing. 
uh, I think states are finding it increasingly difficult to keep up. Uh, and many will be left behind at the current pace, I think. And even if there is work product that reflects the, the, all these different baskets of reforms that I've suggested, there, I think there's a significant danger that the work will splinter uh, through a kind of optionality, a kind of a menu approach where you know, the purpose of the working group was in part to result in greater harmonization of the system, and you may ha end up with uh, quite the opposite. So what would prioritization look like? Uh, candidly, I think some issues should be fast-tracked, prioritized, and other issues should be uh, either uh, eliminated from the agenda or reduced to a kind of second tier. Um, in the latter category, uh, there are a number of issues, including, for example, exhaustion of domestic remedies that I think very few states are interested in. Um, and, and candidly, uh, the discussion might be better had in other fora. I would also mention the multilateral investment court. Uh, that may be heretical to say, but I think it requires a huge amount of resources to discuss and negotiate an investment court. About half the time uh, in, the, in, the, in the room is being spent on the court. Um, given, I think, somewhat tepid support for the court, uh, I think that time would be better spent in other areas and other reforms. And so I think the working group should right size its agenda. Uh, maybe just in closing, the next week, um, uh, looking forward to these two issues, the code of conduct and the multilateral investment court, you know, I would echo the point that uh, Karen made that there has been enormous progress on the code of conduct. We're on to our third draft. Um, uh, I think we're getting very close to consensus on some of the most fundamental rules in the code of conduct, including Article 3 on independence and impartiality, for example. Uh, I would anticipate that a lot of the next week's discussion on the code will focus on some of the more uh, nettlesome issues, including Article 4, uh, which is the, the limits on multiple roles, the double hatting discussion, uh, and also uh, Article 10 on disclosure. Uh, I will say on double hatting that I, I do think that there is an emerging consensus around a fairly cautious approach of uh, recognizing that double hatting has created perceptions of, of conflicts of interest in, in arbitration, but also that um, an overly uh, blunt approach of, for example, banning double hatting outright uh, would reduce the pool of arbitrators, would restrict party autonomy, and, and, and have other complicating implications for the arbitrator pool. Uh, and so I think the working group is sort of moving in the direction of targeted bans or targeted restrictions along with disclosure. Um, as, for, as, as for the question of disclosure, um, and this goes to the prioritization point, uh, we've yet to do uh, a single walkthrough of the latest draft of the rule on disclosure. Um, and so I'm a little bit worried here that we're, we're going to we have maybe just a couple of hours to discuss the, the, the full range of disclosure that arbitrators have to make. Uh, again, trying to complete this entire draft by uh, July of this year. And so I think that conversation is going to be interesting to watch and also very uh, consequential. Um, Maybe just I'll mention, uh, I know we, we, we only have a few minutes uh, for discussion on the standing in investment court discussion. So I, I mentioned at the outset, this has been a discussion we've had for four and a half years. It started with sort of an impetus in creating a court. Uh, this meeting, this working group meeting is the first time that the working group will discuss actual drafting around an investment court, uh, the drafting prepared by the UNCTRAL uh, secretariat. And uh, I won't attempt to, sur to, to survey or summarize the current draft in front of the working group, but I will say that it, it gives rise to enormously complicated questions. There are detailed provisions on uh, the qualifications for judges, uh, in my view, taking inspiration from the ICJ, using concepts like jurists of recognized competence. There are detailed provisions on nominations. Uh, there's envisioned combinations of state appointments uh, and possibly uh, the ability for uh, judges to nominate themselves as candidates. Uh, there are provisions on a selection panel. This is somewhat controversial. The idea of having, um, you have these qualifications for arbitrators, for judges. Um, you have uh, a selection process where, for example, states will, will offer their nominees. And then you'll have an independent selection panel that will vet the judges to make sure that they meet the minimum standards. And, you know, who polices the police and, and those sorts of questions, you know, come into, uh, come into focus. And then I think really the most interesting part of the whole discussion, perhaps, is the voting process. Um, uh, the advocates of a multilateral investment court have said that this is a mechanism that will produce uh, uh, true diversity in every sense, in terms of geographical diversity, gender diversity, ethnic diversity. And so in this draft, this first draft of the, the sort of the instrument that would create the code, the secretariat has envisioned a very complicated voting process where each of the different, there are five, in the UN system, there are five different regional groupings uh, dividing the world. Each of these regional groupings would nominate its own slate 
of candidates of, of, for, for judgeships. And then they would vote on those uh, for themselves. So if you're in, in the in the WIAG, in the Western Europe, um, uh, North America regional grouping, you would nominate and vote for your own candidates. And then uh, if you're in Africa, they have one regional grouping, uh, they would vote on their own. Uh, and that's obviously given rise, rise to a lot of interesting pros and cons discussion. Um, and maybe just one final point before I pause, this conversation about the court, again, I, in my view, uh, there's not a lot of support, but the working group did decide that before we take a final view on the merits or demerits of a multilateral investment court, we have to know what we're talking about. So we've got to design this instrument uh, from a kind of draftsmanship perspective and then engage in a discussion on is this a, a reform that the working group wants to, to back. And so that's the exercise that we're engaged in is this very technical exercise of designing the instrument. And then we're promised a discussion on, is this the right instrument? Is this something that the working group can get behind or not? And so that will be a, a equally important discussion. And so I'll pause there and, and, and Ian, welcome uh, your moderatorship. Well, well let, me, let me just jump in on the last point on this multilateral investment court. I mean, I gave a quick review of the language that's uh, going to be before uh, the working group. And it is indeed really complex. I mean, for junkies on the operations of courts and tribunals, I mean, they're just gonna just love this because this will keep you know anyone meaningfully working for years. Um, but is the idea that this will become a, a sole instrument in itself and that it would be something that could be adopted by, you know, or, you know say a specific bilateral investment treaty saying we're rather than going to ICSID or ancestral rules, you will, you know, the arbitrators will be appointed pursuant to this instrument. Is, is that the idea? You know, I, I'd welcome Karen's view. I, I think that that question is, is undecided at this point. Uh, you know, there are some in the room who think that this institution would be uh, affiliated in some manner with the United Nations or with UNCITRAL, that it would sit alongside UNCITRAL. Um, there are others who view it uh, in a different way, that it will be a freestanding institution with its own budget, with its own um, institution and, 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 and support. Um, in terms of how states might incorporate uh, an investment court in their agreements. This is a, a hugely complex topic and that it's, it's subject to its own basket of, of kind of reform discussions in the working group implementing these reforms. I think that there is a just general view that, um, that uh, this would be available uh, for states to opt into in their future agreements. So if you were to negotiate a bilateral investment treaty, uh, the, the, the two contracting states could consent to have disputes resolved using the investment court. Uh, I think what's perhaps even more aggressive or, or, or forward leaning is to also apply the, the court backwards in time to existing treaties following the approach that the working group uh, used in the Mauritius convention with respect to transparency, that there'll be a separate uh, convention or multilateral instrument, uh, separate from the court instrument. So can, uh, states can sign on to this instrument and decide uh, with uh, like-minded states to revise their existing agreements to either incorporate the court as an option or as the only option to replace existing ad hoc arbitration options. Well, it would seem we, we in some ways, we, this would be a proliferation of institutions in which, you know, one, at least the negotiators of a treaty can kind of go to, they could have a choice between, as we have now, ancestral rules and ICSID, and then uh, and now potentially a new, you know, UN mechanism. Um, it, it, it does beg the question about whether we should, uh, and this comes from the ICSID perspective, having just gone through this discussion on reform, about whether this is really necessary. I mean, do we need another mechanism? And I guess part of that goes to its structure in the sense that it really is the, the you know, opposite of the arbitration mechanism that has been the chosen course, you know, since the 1960s. I mean, a very conscious choice was to choose international arbitration. And this derives from developments in the international disputes world going back to the Permanent Court of Arbitration in 1899. Uh, and it really is a sea change in, in how these things are viewed, at least from the investment arbitration mode, clearly from world, you know, the World Trade Organization and the ICJ, the idea of a court is not um, unfamiliar, but it, it really would be, uh, uh, it, you know, in my submission, kind of a dramatic change. But maybe one of those elements, and this goes to a question from one of our uh, list uh, attendees, it goes to, you know, this would, I assume, include a appellate mechanism. 
them. And that's kind of one of the innovations that this would uh, con you know, contribute to more consistency uh, in the process. Is, is, is that right, Lauren? Yes, appellate, uh, appellate sort of started as a as joined at the hip with the notion of accord. And I think that some states have viewed the issues as distinct. And so there are states that I think are, are interested in appellate that may not support uh, a court. But I, I think you, you described it exactly right, Ian, that um, there is a concern about a kind of a multiplication of institutions and um, uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater, which has led to some skepticism about the court. But I think with respect to appellate, there is a view uh, across a wide range of states of a need for greater consistency in the interpretation of, of obligations, um, uh, similarly worded obligations in different treaties. Um, and there's concern that, that that the existing corrective mechanisms maybe aren't sufficient in terms of the, you know, the limited scope of review of, a, of an ICSID annulment committee, for example. But I will say that, um, and I see Karen's hand was up, so I wanna give her the floor, but I, I do think that there are equal number of, of states that are concerned about looking at the example of the WTO appellate body and, and sort of the political crisis in that mechanism that is this the right time to create a, a new permanent mechanism that would have really enormous authority over the interpretation, not of one agreement, but thousands of agreements, which in some respects makes it even more difficult and problematic than you have in the WTO, where at least you have you know, one body of agreements that, that are sort of an integral whole. Um, very complex issues, but I, I do think the issues are distinct, Ian, and, and, and you're right to point that out. But Karen, you've been waiting, sorry. No, no, that's okay. I was just going to, I was just going to jump in and say, I, I saw the comment about the appellate review. And I was just going to say that, I mean, as, as you noted, um, appellate review seems to have been now um, decoupled from the court. It would be probably part of the court, but there are certainly delegations who are interested in appellate review as a possibility separate and apart from the court. Um, and I think this whole question of, you know, how do we decide what gets implemented is, is as you, as you flagged, its own separate work stream. And there will be, you know, a looking at um, how how do you construct a multilateral treaty that will allow for the greatest number of parties to adopt the standards that are appropriate for an agreement for a treaty um, and make that match and I think that's really to be perfectly honest a question that we don't have an answer for yet because it's not really clear that the um, Mauritius Convention or the OECD um, BEPS Convention are really the perfect analog, but there's probably some combination of that. And so that is another topic that, that will begin to be worked on. And there had been sort of a thought that, well, let's just save that for the end because you know we know how to do that. And I think as this whole process has evolved, the working group has come to realize, and this has really been more at the um, instigation of Chile and Australia, that we need to start thinking about this now because that will inform how we structure some of these reforms. And not all reforms are going to need to be in the treaties treaty context. Certainly, if you're establishing some kind of permanent body that's going to decide cases, you'll need to have some kind of set up structure there. Um, but for many of these uh, that can have real impact sooner, you don't need a treaty. Um, you, you, can, you can look at the code of conduct as an example of, of an instrument that can be implemented in multiple ways and at different times. You know, if, if you know, knock on wood, we are able to finish the, the code by uh, July, which I'm, I'm hopeful and, and relatively confident that we'll, we should be able to get the, the language itself done. Um, whether we can do the commentary is a completely different question, and that's something that will have to be, have to be worked on because that's an important part as well. But you could see that as being a sort of soft law instrument that gets adopted by ICSID and UNCITRAL that applies in the rules that parties then begin to incorporate in their own agreements. And then at some point later on, when we when we have an, a, multi, a multilateral instrument, gets adopted there. And many of these reforms, I think, will, will, will fall in fall fall into the category though of not necessarily needing a treaty. You can think of dispute prevention reform, some of these types of things, even some of the ADR provisions, maybe, maybe guidelines and guidance that may have much more impact even though they don't right. come in a capital T, T treaty, so. Thanks for that, Karen. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's an important perspective uh, in terms of that uh, Uncertral doesn't always have to go big. There can be all sorts of uh, incremental in innovations that uh, really uh, fight above or hit above their weight, so to speak. Um, uh, 
as we're coming to the end of our time, we've got uh, another five, six minutes. I just want to invite Mallory or Borzu or Jose Antonio, if you uh, want to jump in with any comments. Uh, Jose Antonio, I see you've taken your mute off. Thank you, Ian, and, and thank you, Karen and, and Lauren, for walking us uh, through you know, uh, what is certainly a very, very complex uh, process. Um, my my, you know, my my reaction is is uh, it, it's uh, it's a little bit ironic that 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 uh, that one of the uh, main goals uh, and, and and worries was uh, the lack of consistency, and we might end up with uh, a system that uh, will be not not even dualist uh, because we might have a court uh, and and an arbitration, but but uh, we might end up with a, a, a fairly um, fragmented system, um, uh, but but beyond that, what I, I wanted to ask you a more positive question, which is, uh, besides the multilateral investment court, um, which which is an initiative that that clearly has has a uh, no no consensus uh, or no clear consensus, uh, which are the you know the, the three four projects that that have made this uh, uh, incredibly complex negotiations uh, worthwhile. Uh, I know that the code of conduct is one, but it may be useful for everyone who's watching to sort of point out um, which, which are the projects that, that uh, you see building up uh, as, as a sort of uh, consensus-like projects, which would be a positive contribution for uh, the investment dispute settlement system. Go ahead, um, okay. Uh, well, um, I'll, I'll give probably a more of a process answer, um, given that you know I don't want to prejudge any 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 outcomes. But I, I think some of what we're going to find is that um, you know Lauren mentioned that prioritization is a is a dirty word in the in the working group, and I and I, I think that's that that that's fair. But sequencing is important, and also. Uh, ability to to come up with a solution that can that, that can be be managed. I think what we're going to find is that some things are going to be easier to do, and some are going to, as we explore them, be harder to do. Um, predicting that right now is is a little hard. I mean, I think you know you can see that there's obviously models for many of the procedural reforms, like frivolous claims and third party funding and security for costs. Whether you look at ICSID or you look at state practice itself. Um, that, that may make it easier to adopt um, approaches. Some of the others though are going to raise some questions that, that, that will require some, some careful thought and that may make it harder to, to um, find consensus or, or come up with a solution. So I, I don't wanna say that there's nothing that can be done. Um, I think some things though may be easier than others and those are probably ones where we have experience with um, a type of reform and can can draw on on that practice and I think you know to some extent the code of conduct has been a good example because while it doesn't draw you know one for one from the IBA guidelines it's certainly been informed and the experience there has either indicated what raised additional concerns that needed to be addressed for example or um perhaps things that that or, or or rules that that are more manageable and workable so um i realize that's not a not a crystal ball answer for you but i think those would be the factors that i would look at in terms of how to determine what would what what may be doable and what won't be i, I would just add i think that's a great question jose antonio and and i second everything you said karen in terms of um looking at the great work product that we have in many sort of latest generation treaties and not necessarily taking that work product and just inserting it into the working group, uh, but rather uh, examining it, improving it, um, and building upon it, I think uh, can save a lot of time and can also get the benefit of lots of states' experience uh, that have both negotiated these agreements and litigated under them. Uh, but I would say that there is an interest in doing things that are new, and, and that's uh, important in the working group. And in terms of looking for areas where you have a lot of consensus uh, where the, 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 the task is not unachievable. I think you look at something like the Multilateral Advisory Center, uh, which you know, many states are looking at uh, parallel in the WTO, the ACWL, uh, to provide support for uh, developing and, and, and least developed states. There's a lot of support for that. There's a lot of work that's already been done. 
Uh, you look at ADR, we, we, which we discussed uh, all the way going back to the uh, discussion in the, in the uh, ICSID rules amendment process, and uh, ways to facilitate the use of ADR. Um, and some of this may not even be you know, treaty text or model provisions. It may be uh, tools that can educate not just you know, people who are on this call, but um, uh, state officials that don't practice investment law to educate them about their treaties, about uh, the availability of different non-contentious forms of dispute settlement, dispute prevention. There's a lot of interest in that in the working group there, and there are really good papers. I'd recommend a, a look at the, the website that, um, uh, that Ian mentioned. There's a lot on the, on the website, but if you look at some of the submissions around the multilateral investment, or sorry, advisory center, you'll see a lot of creative ideas. And, and I would just say, um, as a third, the, the, the basket of substantively, uh, not process, substantively, the notion of looking at ISDS procedural rules reforms, I, you know, I, I started to mention some of them on dismissal of frivolous claims, um, uh, dealing with costs, parallel proceedings. I think there's a lot of interest in, in those kinds of tools. And critically, those kinds of tools are relevant both to an ad hoc system and also to a, a system involving permanent, uh, a permanent court. And so again, there's both consensus and there'd be a lot of payoff for exploring these areas where uh, pretty much everybody in the room thinks these are worthwhile reforms to look at. Uh, and so I think looking at consensus, looking at what we can achieve and to Karen's really valuable point, building off what we already have, I think is a way to prioritize and to achieve something that the working group can, um, can really improve the system. Thanks very much, uh, Lauren. And I think we're going to have to cut off there. Uh, we've come to the end of our time. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, all of our uh, panelists today, Lauren, uh, Karen, and Mallory. That's truly a fantastic and uh, illuminating uh, uh, addition uh, and update on, on these uh, very important issues. We'll, we'll uh, uh, look forward to uh, the ICSID rules uh, being, uh, the new ICSID rules being uh, approved or voted on and then uh, coming into effect in July. And uh, of course, Working Group 3 uh, looks to be uh, chugging along over the next uh, couple of years, but uh, this code of conduct uh, looks like it may be coming to a head. Uh, so folks can uh, follow that closely. And again, those materials are on the Working Group uh, website. And just finally, uh, thanks to uh, the folks at the ILI for putting this together, uh, Jeff uh, Ziarnik and uh, Gorgon Karapedian, uh, who've uh, made the trains run on time. So thanks so much for uh, your efforts and your contribution. And uh, great uh, seeing everyone. And uh, thanks very much for attending. Uh, we very much appreciate it and look forward to seeing you next time. Have a good afternoon, evening, morning. Bye-bye.